Hannah Arendt's worst nightmare. Shakespeare knew the power of nightmares. Nightmares are woven by Shakespeare into the mental being of the audience through the visuals of tortured characters. Sleep no more, Macbeth claims. Macbeth doth murdered sleep. Here, we experience the sleep stopped by murderous dreams or the dreams themselves violently stopped through murder. Hannah Arendt knew the power of nightmares. We will soon see what I believe is Arendt's worst nightmare. First, though, I will move the discussion to the close subject of victimhood and through that to what I see as Shakespeare's expression of human potentiality. We need a few definitions. Victimization is the subjection of a being to violent or unjust treatment. The identity of victimization or victimhood indicates a related shift in self-definition arguably caused by the centrality of that experience. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs writes, do not define yourself as a victim, define yourself as a free moral agent. Sachs is saying that instead of being identified as victims, humans are identified through moral agency. Victimhood in some way precludes moral agency if we stop defining ourselves as victims, we can be free moral agents. Moral freedom is discussed by Robert B. Brandon in The Spirit of Trust. He writes, to be morally free from consents is to make oneself responsible just by taking oneself to be responsible. If we decide we are responsible, we are in fact free moral agents. Brandon here is intimating that moral agency requires choice. Arendt, in her 1971 lecture, Thinking and Moral Considerations, juxtaposes moral agency to non-thinking. She says that the monstrous deeds of Eichmann resulted from an authentic inability to think. Here, Arendt and Brandon seem to concur. They concur on the idea that moral agency is a proactive, choice-making state of being, one which require, requires thought. Victimhood, however, indicates non-thought. Victimhood is a reactive, really a shocked state of being and not proactive. Victimhood and free moral agency, if not opposite, then are certainly opposed. It takes active choice to transform from one state of being to the next. Let us return to the quote by Sachs. Do not define yourself as a victim. Define yourself as a free moral agent. What is striking is the imperative and appropriate decision, I think, given the political climate, climate in Israel, the US, and England. The imperative in the quote indicates a schism between who we are and who we really are. Sachs, this paper offers, is suggesting potentiality of proactive transformation from how we are being to how we can be. A transformation from victimhood to free moral agency. This transformation is supported by both, we will soon see, Hannah Arendt and William Shakespeare. I argue that by applying theories of Arendt to the plays of Shakespeare, it is possible to transform, not victimization, the Jews clearly are and have been tragic victims of persecution for centuries, but rather victimization as a central identity. Victimhood, I claim, overshadows the freedom required in ethical action. Victimhood, we will soon see, is coercive. It curtails the ethical agency of all humanity. It holds us back from a precious sense of being. It contributes to the capitalization of violence, as explored by Arendt and soon to be discussed. Therefore, this paper is making a call for a transformation from victimhood to free moral agency. Shakespeare provides a strong archetype for this endeavor. Structurally, this paper will be in four parts. The first part will explain basic Jewish thought, that which I believe influenced the rest. Then I will negotiate victimhood in more detail with free moral agency. I will next review victimhood in the critical history of the Merchant of Venice. Finally, I will show how Arendt's writings and her support of specific rabbinic teachings can possibly indicate a shift towards a stronger focus on moral agency and the associated epiphanic space within Shakespeare criticism. Jewish thought is threaded into this paper because Jewish thought 
I believe, was threaded into Arendt's mental being for much of her life. Part one, Jewish thought as Arendt probably learned it. There is not one way to define Judaism. Judaism is never set. It is always evolving and in continual spiritual and cultural conversation. Traditionally, however, Jewish thought refers to the volumes of Tanakh commentary. The Tanakh is the Judaic term for the Hebrew Bible. It includes the Torah, the five books of Moses, or the scriptures gifted figuratively or literally by God at Mount Sinai. The Talmud, redacted on parchment from the 3rd to the 5th century CE, consists of rabbinic commentary on the Hebrew Bible. Talmud focuses on how morals learned in the Torah can be applied behaviorally in the present. Talmud therefore exemplifies the struggle for free moral agency. Rashi, Ibn Ezra, Maimonides, Nachmanides, and Joseph Kara are post-Talmudic rabbis who I believe are widely known. 20th and 21st century rabbis include Abraham Joshua Heschel, Martin Buber, and more recently, David Rosen and Jonathan Sachs. Judaism is a rabbinic rather than a biblical culture. The Jews negotiate big questions through rabbinic commentary. Jewish thought is important, however, not only because it influenced Durant. In the past three or four decades, Shakespearean criticism has begun to attract many Jewish thinkers. For Jewish criticism to authentically illuminate the plays of Shakespeare, it needs to include more than victimhood. I argue that Jewish Shakespeare criticism needs to include the metaphysical. The metaphysical infers questions pertaining to abstract concepts, such as, for example, causality and being. Moral agency, I claim, is metaphysical, and that it determines how we are being. Moral agency has the power to shift actual behavior and action for the better. The metaphysical in Judaism and its associated moral agency, we will see, is supported by Arendt. Part two, victimhood as compared to free moral agency. How then would this lineage of Jewish thought, which so influenced Arendt, beginning with the Talmud, negotiate victimhood? <coughs> Talmud, according to David Rosen, focuses primarily on biblical chosenness rather than on victimization. Chosenness connects being chosen with choosing. Religious chosenness comes from the section of the Torah concerning a covenant with God. If one is seemingly chosen to have a bond or a covenant with an ultimate power, then one is choosing to act on that bond, which means acting with moral agency. Chosenness is proactive. Victimhood, in comparison, often is hidden even from the victim. Victimhood, I claim, and we will soon see, alludes to interpolation as theorized by Louis Althusser in ideology and ideological state apparatuses. An interpolated being is unknowingly immersed in an ideology. He can strangely be complicit in a destructive ideology and not even know it. A being can continually be complicit in his victimhood, as reestablished in media, entertainment, and we will soon see criticism. Chosenness, when corrupted, can also lead to interpolation. Chosenness is corrupted and no longer religious when it becomes exclusive or commodified. This is the chosenness, I believe, which event in our origins of totalitarianism calls racist superstition. An exclusive interpretation of chosenness is the American Manifest Destiny ideology, which led to the murder of millions of Native Americans in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. Another exclusive interpretation of chosenness is a covenantal ideology in which a covenant is offered only to the Israelites. Even if this is a correct literal reading of the Hebrew Bible, by repeating it without traditional rabbinic commentary and the associate, associated emphasis on love, the critic is reflecting and reestablishing an ideology of entitlement. He and the accusant reader become incorporated in a potentially violent paradigm. I claim that the continual reestablishment of entitlement coupled with victimhood creates a Pavlovian behavior of aggression and violence. The victim wants more than the other and feels entitled to it and will fight for it because he feels that his victimization is more extreme. Entitlement, however, is not Jewish. In Judaism, every human is created in the divine image. 
It is not Jewish or rabbinic to say that one person is chosen for a special covenant and the other is not. Shakespeare in The Merchant of Venice shows that chosenness also becomes corrupted when commodified. Being chosen, being, being chosen, as Portia declares, comes from being able to choose right. If a suitor first chooses the right coffin, he is then chosen. He is chosen to be Portia's husband and mate. Of course, choosing right in the merchant plot is connected to a language of economics like winning the fleece, as Gratiano claims, and Portia's counterfeit, as described by Bassania. Merchant characters in this way become complicit in what can be seen as a Pavlovian behavior of materialist obsession as continually reestablished by the mercantilist culture of 16th century Venice. However, when chosenness is not corrupted, it offers the freedom of moral agency. It frees humankind beyond the limitations of ideology. It allows us as one people to break through repetitive cycles of subjugation. The choice to walk out of a culture of subjugation is possible and present. We can, after all, have an epiphany and decide that we are all chosen to take part in perhaps a kinder universe. The tradition of religious chosenness, I argue, partly explains Rand's comment in Eichmann in Jerusalem that the lesson of the Holocaust is within everybody's grasp. It makes sense we will soon see that if we can all, in our plurality, choose to be free moral agents, we can all learn lessons from world tragedy, and we can all be held equally responsible for that same tragedy. We can all then initiate a world free of tragedy. Merchant criticism post-Holocaust has not focused on chosenness and that potentiality. Merchant criticism has mostly focused on victimhood. I only have time here to review a few examples of that respective criticism. Part three, anti-Semitism in merchant and victimhood in merchant criticism. Merchant critical history is consumed was seeking out the bigots, tribal conflicts, and twisted religious writings of early modern England, which victimized the Jew, and in extension, Shylock as well. It is understandable. At the start of the trial scene in Merchant, Gratiano, after all, says this to the Jew Shylock, that souls of animals infuse themselves into the trunks of men, that cursed spirit governed a wolf who hanged for human slaughter, even from the gallows did his fell soul fleet. And whilst thou layest in thy unhallowed dom, it fused itself in thee, for thy desires are wolfish, bloody, starved, and rabbits. This monologue portrays an animal soul traveling covertly through the air, trunks my bodies of men, and ravenous wolves hanging from trees. There is also a uterus of a woman, or dumb, obviously estranged from her cognitive being as it is bizarrely entered by cursed spirits. All hope for an orderly trial collapses with these chaotic images. Some sense of order, I claim, is, however, grot grotesquely apparent in the same monologue. Literally, people, not wolves, are hanged for human slaughter. The monologue, therefore, begins with a wolf as personified in the passive he is hanged, and ends with a person fetus passively transformed by a wolf or soul. There is something strangely cyclical here, a weird announcement of the circulation of evil, in which the Jew is the central demon. In the astute introduction to the Arden edi edition of The Merchant of Venice, John Dracakis traces the early modern demonization of the Jew. His exploration maintains this fixation and pointedly culminates in the text on the Jews and their lives by Martin Luther and, in the words of Dracakis, its hideous apotheosis in Hitler's main Kampf. While Dracakis connects these two writings in one sentence, in real time, they are separated by 400 years. Other events leading to the Holocaust certainly happened during those 400 years. Therefore, while defending one culture Jewish, Dracakis reaches to the extreme of demonizing another Protestant as the alleged perpetrator. This approach, while in support of the Jewish people, ironically conflicts with Jewish thought. Debru Emet, Speak the Truth, a document signed by more than 200 rabbis and scholars in 2000, states that there is a Jewish willingness not to forget but to put behind us the unique tragic past that be devil the Jewish-Christian relationship. I offer that while the inspection of anti-Semitism within the Merchant of Venice is necessary, obvious, to achieve accurate criticism of that play, 
that inspection at the expense of cultures in the present day shadows what I see as the Shakespearean theme of moral agency. James Shapiro, in Shakespeare and the Jews, centrally positions the Merchant of Venice and early modern England within a landscape in which the Jew is violently reviled, he writes. The Jewish man was constructed as a creature of the bodily fluids, spin spinning, sinking. Even if Shapiro is correct about his early modern construction, the vividness of the imagery indicates Shapiro's belief that the best way to respond to anti-Semitism and to analyze merchant is to focus vigorously on his biased images. I argue that this focus on the images can create a strange fascination with them. Once again, this fascination can shadow a Shakespearean theme of moral agency. Julia Lupton points to other themes besides victimhood in Shakespeare dwelling. Lupton emphasizes the importance of the placing of votive offerings in certain places which could each broker a relationship between the preservation of culture, the judging of value, and the exercise of public speech, as well as cultivate habits of care towards persons and places. Here, Lupton is proactively illuminating a behavior of moral agency. She is explaining specifically how moral agency and its positive results are expressed through offerings in the world of Shakespeare's plays. Stephen Greenblatt demonstrates that victimhood is coercive. In Invisible Bullets, Greenblatt explains that in the early modern era, there was a coercive power of European beliefs, which victimized the American natives and caused the natives' own beliefs to collapse under them. In his later article, The Limits of Hatred, Greenblatt emphasizes that in The Merchant of Venice, there is a Jewish victimization. Shakespeare's aesthetic solution, Greenblatt writes, lies in an assimilation to which the enemy finally consents because the alternative is to lose his life and his livelihood. Here, Greenblatt is correctly indicating that Shylock must assimilate to the Christian enemy. I add, though, that Shylock is coerced not only by the Christian, but by a misunderstanding of his religion resulting from the victimhood which he accepts. He does not see or think beyond that identity. Shylock relies on his victimhood. Critics as discussed, as well as artists and entertainment and online companies, I claim, also seemingly rely on victimhood. They focus diligently on victimization to reestablish that same victimhood by which they seemingly define themselves. The victim becomes complicit in his and others' victimhood. Sarah Kudin intimates this complicity in Is Shylock Jewish? She describes Shylock as an anti-Semitic myth which lives beyond the stage. She says that Shylock bleeds off the page into our historic actuality. I agree, it is painful. The anti-Semitism in Merchant certainly creates a cognitive reawakening of genocide. I claim, though, that we as critics sometimes unintentionally bleed onto that same page. We influence the work, but not maybe as we would like. Terence Hawkes references the potential positive influence of our, of our mental beings on the play when he says, we do the perceiving, we speak, we mean, I add, we bleed. In this bleeding, the intensity of our written words furthers victimhood. We may as well therefore figure a way to staunch that bleeding. Our criticism then might hopefully mark a positive transformation in this world. Ewan Fernie, in Shakespeare for Freedom, emphasizes the urgency of that transformation. He says there is a question of what to do now. But the question for me is how to affect change. Victimhood, after all, is the prevailing mode of influence today, shared by established critics and characters, real and not real, all strangely complicit or fashioned as such in the same powerful continuum of victimhood. There is something other, though, I claim, another way to envision the community. This brings us to the subject of sacrifice. The sacrifice in biblical Hebrew is the korban. The victim and the korban are not the same. The victim feels farther from God, while the root word of korban intimates a coming closer. The scapegoat, for example, is described in the Hebrew Bible as a korban. The scapegoat in the Bible has a holy appointment to take on the sins of the Israelites and purge them through its dramatic death. Rene Girard, in A Theater of Envy, describes Shylock in Merchant as a scapegoat. However, he sees Antonio as a scapegoat in the making. 
The idea of a scapegoat in the making gives it a sacrificial quality. It also assigns the scapegoat a Derridian present messianic gift. Of course, the philosophy of Jacques Derrida intimates a wider discussion. Let us just say that the sacrifice, such as the scapegoat, in the making is both future and present in that it is happening now. Of course, Antonio does not become the proverbial sacrificing merchant. He is not symbolically crucified in court. And Shylock, I claim, does not receive his revelation. However, Gerard, while aligning Shylock with victimization, he does say that Shylock is a victim still indicates a certain korban potentiality. Even if the characters are victims during the play, they are not completely victims. There is a chance for transformation. There is something, as Gerard says, in the making, something I claim different, awesome, and revelatory. Today, the Jew internalizes the korban of the sacrifice and transforms it to daily prayer. Victimhood, however, in Orthodox Judaism, is given only one day a year of intense focus. On the ninth of Av, in the Hebrew calendar, all of the tragedies of Judaism are said to have happened, the fall of the Second Temple, the expulsion from England and from Spain, etc. On this day, the Jews recognized that inner bickering within rabbinic circles contributed to the tragedies. They recognized their partial responsibility for their own victimization, victimization associated with centuries of persecution. The ninth of Av allows the Orthodox to consolidate victimhood into one day a year opening up the rest of the year for moral agency. Orthodoxy, though, has its constraints, as we will soon see. Arendt was most probably familiar with the Ninth of Ab myth and discourse, partly illuminating her thoughts, as discussed in his paper on responsibility. Since Jewish victimhood is nevertheless daily reestablished by respected critics, journalists, and artists, politicians capitalize on that identity. Politicians use that identity in their various violent endeavors. Critics, artists, entertainers, computer gurus, and entrepreneurs reasonably see how victimhood can contribute to their theories and creations. In the public sphere, the Jew reasonably sees a validation of a Jewish identity based on victimization. The Jews, therefore, continually re-identify as victims. The resulting anger, I believe, can be used by those in power, and therefore it contributes to a perpetration of violence, this time against other cultures, such as, I claim, the Palestinians. I want to stress that in aligning Judaism only with victimization, Judaism is then disassociated from foundational rabbinic teachings, which focus on free moral agency. Whenever a religion or criticism associated with that religion coerces a people into an identification which undermines the main beliefs of that people, there are the figurative, invisible bullets of Greenblatt's seminal, seminal article. Of course, in the case of Greenblatt's description of the American natives, as I discussed, a different religion, religion, Christianity, was and still is used to undermine them. In the case of the Jews, a subversion of their same religion is probably unintentional. Jews have been victimized. The critical norm is therefore victimhood. However, when victimhood becomes central, in criticism or in other modes of communication, the Jews are undermined. Just as the natives are stripped of their spiritual beliefs, the Jews' spiritual beliefs and ethical codes collapse under them. I am not comparing the pain of one people to the other. I am, though, comparing figurative bullets and their overall effects. The continual re-identification of the Jews as victims has become norm normative. As Shaul Bassi claims in Shylock's Jewish Experience, a wonderful review, it is this condition of exile and alienation that invites many Jewish intellectuals to identify with Shylock. Bassi says it is this condition of exile, indicating and taking for granted that Jewish scholars identify with this condition. While exile is certainly included in the Jewish narrative, it is not the whole Jewish narrative. Exile leads to revelation. For Bassi, though, there is not a question as to whether victimization is or is not the dominant identity of Judaism. In Bassi's statement, it simply is. Victimhood nurtures inter interesting apologies for Shylock. The supposed perfect construct of Judaism ex is explained through the actions of the supposedly perfect Jewish character, Shylock. But this explanation is illogical. Shylock does, after all, attempt murder. Murder is not supported in Judaism by any denomination or rabbi. 
This apology for Shylock weirdly points to a simile used by Leonard Tenenhouse in Power on Display, the politics of Shakespeare genres. There, Tenenhouse says that the attempt to immerse himself in the distant past and remove himself from the present is like wriggling out of a close-fitting shirt or a cultural skin. While this comment has sparked interesting discussions, I want to emphasize that in this effort of wriggling, the figurative shirt likely gets wrecked. The present must by nature become somewhat mangled while the critic is wriggling out of it. Likewise, Judaism must be somewhat mangled while the critic is wriggling it into the person of Shylock. While the comparison, of course, has its flaws, it does help to indicate the feeling that something in the perfectly Jewish Shylock motif is just not fitting right. It is so not right, I claim, that it leads to fascism and totalitarianism. Eichmann, for example, during his trial, as explored by Arendt, spoke of the humbling of the Nazis, who were often exhausted and cold. The image of humility indicates a certain Christian ethos. Arendt writes in Eichmann in Jerusalem, the murderers would be able to say what horrible things I had to watch in the pursuance of my duties, how heavily the task weighed upon my shoulders. <coughs> Here, Christianity is being mangled to fit into Nazi soldiers. In the example of the hard-working Nazis, Arendt not only infers a Christian ethos, but alludes to the capitalization of violence. In other words, the nation at war, in Arendt's analysis, began to operate as a well-organized capitalist endeavor like an enterprise. The Nazi soldiers in the above quote resemble hard-working blue-collar workers on a figurative factory line. The Nazi soldiers are here seen as victims. Eichmann, in Arendt's writing, identifies the Nazi soldiers as victims. Today, governments politicize victimization in order to support the related capitalization of violence or the enterprise of war. The reestablishment of the identity of victimization through criticism as well as in other venues, like the internet, I claim, itself is capitalized upon by many politicians for their personal successes. Critics unknowingly perpetuate this identity, which fosters violence rather than mitigating it. There is no doubt that many characters in The Merchant of Venice are at base anti-Semitic. I argue, however, that the relentless focus on victimhood supports violence. In Jewish thought, another way to understand this argument is in the biblical discussion of Amalek. The Israelites are said to, told to, obliterate the remembrance of Amalek, the symbol of evil from beneath the heavens. We must not forget. This is a confusing statement which has received rabbinic attention. Simply put, the way of Judaism is to write Amalek as a remembrance and to erase the name continually. We are therefore in the continual space of remembering Amalek and creating some potentiality and moral agency beyond evil and victimhood. Arendt in her philosophy, I argue, creates that potentiality for free moral agency. Part four, some of Arendt's thoughts. Freedom to the post-Holocaust thinker Hannah Arendt, <coughs> therefore free moral agency, as explained in Freedom and Politics, the lecture, is the raison d'etre of politics. Arendt wants freedom. Arendt's goal seems to be to figure a path to moral freedom after the victimization of the Holocaust. The field of freedom, Arendt claims, is action. It is an action based on principle rather than intellect or will. For example, she allocates freedom to Brutus in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar when he says that this shall be or we shall fall for it. Here, according to Arendt, Brutus is calling something into being which did not exist before. The action of Brutus and the mind of Brutus is not intellectual, but one based on a higher value. Freedom to Arendt is like a flowing stream and is therefore a marginal phenomenon, which somehow forms the boundary of government should not overstep. The one challenge in Arendt's analysis is that, in my opinion, the only way to negotiate a virtue or a principle is to ironically think about it. We must think about a principle before we act on it. We recognize our will when we act on the principle. We first see and give definitions in the figurative stream before flowing with it. Therefore, action to a rent based solely on principle and not intellect points to freedom, but at the same time, such an action is impossible in conventional thought. There must, however, be thought. The lack of thought creates a being who goes along with any situation, even immoral. Non-thought leads to evil. 
I argue, therefore, that this need for non-thought, despite the danger, calls for unconventional thought. It calls for an exceptional moment, such as a sigh or an epiphany, framed by and guarded by thought. We find this exceptional moment, or this metaphysical possibility, supported by Arendt in a 1947 article in Commentary Magazine. Arendt says that a Jewish culture could be constructed by fusing three strands, the metaphysical post-biblical tradition, Yiddish writers of Eastern Europe, and finally all those who come into conflicts with Jewish orthodoxy. This statement needs to be quickly unfolded. The metaphysical post-biblical trajectory, which like a long time to try to explain, but it begins with the Dead Sea Scrolls, 3 BCE to 2 CE, and the Separatist of Qumran, and continues with the Merkava cherry in this 100 BCE to 1000 CE, in which ascendancy to a higher state of mind is based on hierarchical visions of layers to a universal power. The mystical Zohar was published in Venice in the early 16th century and illustrates that the world was created by a holy epiphany. The imagery is beautiful, but highly esoteric. The metaphysical in Judaism had, by the time of the Zohar, become elitist. Only the select few could even understand it. Then, in the 18th century, came Hasidut. Hasidut aimed to connect Jewish mysticism to the people. The traveling Magid, or storyteller, of Eastern Europe would transmit the epiphany of the Zohar through stories and song about everyday life. This tradition of the Magid and the metaphysical as a gift to the people is what Arendt references in her focus on, on Yiddish stories. Rabbi Martin Buber and more recently Rabbi Rami Shapiro have translated Yiddish stories. The ultimate Magid, 1698-1760, was the Baal Shem Tov, the master of the good name. Since the Holocaust, scholars and rabbis such as Abraham Joshua Heschel, influenced by Hasidut, have focused on these Megidic teachings. These neo-Hasidic rabbis have influenced American Judaism. Some Shakespeare scholars are starting to reflect this direct or indirect influence of the Magid. Kenneth Gross exemplifies neo-Hasidic themes in Shylock as Shakespeare. Gross creatively not only reveals his own subjectivity, but that of Shakespeare, thereby arguably turning Shakespeare into a Magid himself. Gross writes, this character I've made, the Shylock is myself. I, like Shylock, deal in strange promises and merry bonds. Gross's scholarship, coupled with the Magidic instinct, forms a meeting ground between the intellective and the accessible through a poetic subjective style. This poetic subjectivity circumvents victimhood and points to attitudes of care in Shakespeare's plays of moral agency, as intimated earlier by Lupton. While victimhood, however, still remains the dominant focus of Jewish Shakespeare critics, I believe that this focus can be transformed. Greenblatt's analysis of the prayer Kaddish in Hamlet and Purgatory offers the opportunity for a case study of potential critical transformation. Greenblatt's analysis underlines an identity of victimization as influenced by his orthodox background. He mentions the burden of having to recite Kaddish daily for his deceased father and orthodox custom, and his irritation that his father designated other people to recite the prayer for him. Greenblatt here is certainly rightly confronting orthodoxy, one of the suggestions of Arendt. <coughs> After his autobiographical and historical narrative concerning Kaddish, Greenblatt says then that he does not know how to pray. Whether or not knowing how to pray or trying to speak with the dead, Greenblatt perhaps naturally through these sudden comments, engages in Magidic storytelling style. In Hasidic tradition, he is relaying that he values metaphysical moments enough to mention even the lack of them. He therefore points to perhaps a breakthrough of Jewish impact in Shakespeare's scholarship. Greenblatt's literal explanation, however, of Kaddish falls short. He does not relate the metaphysical potentiality of the Aramaic prayer. Kaddish, I argue, creates chapters in the prayer service. There is more than one Kaddish. There is, for example, a full Kaddish, a scholar's Kaddish, half Kaddish, and a mourner's Kaddish. Each is similar rhythmically, though not the same. When a Kaddish is recited, there is a cognitive awareness that the congregation is entering the next, for lack of a better word, chapter of the service. 
The prayer Kaddish is therefore seen as a figurative gate in liturgy. Mortar's Kaddish, the final prayer of the service, focuses on life but indicates to the congregants a time to honor the dead. As a Kaddish, however, it actively creates a feeling of entry and continuation, as if a whole new chapter is about to begin. This new chapter references the possible soul of the dead as well as the experiences of those who mourn. In this way, not only prayer, but the essence of those past remains intense in the mental being of the mourner. Because of the rhythmic elements of Kaddish and his repetition, it inspires exceptional moments of transcendence. Kaddish therefore supplies, in Arendt's philosophy, a moment of freedom, specifically free moral agency within its very thoughtful construct. It is more, therefore, than a hexen obligation or a historical event. Perhaps Greenblatt's goal in his explanation of Kaddish was only to indicate the constraints of orthodoxy and victimization. But I think he was referencing something more than that. If he had included an explanation of the metaphysical in Kaddish with his powerful Megidic style, I believe Greenblatt's already penetrating analysis of Shakespeare's ghosts could find even greater depth. Conclusion. Freedom and transformation have certainly been concerns in merchant and related criticism. The Jewish critical history continually attempts to negotiate Shylock's freedom from anti-Semitism, but as I have demonstrated, it does so by singularly focusing on victimhood. While Lipkin, Greenblatt, and Gross have begun to negotiate beyond that identity and create an emphasis on moral agency, there is much work left to do. What could possibly be Hannah Arendt's worst nightmare? My guess is that it is non-thought, supported by the very non-thought, which has victimized the Jewish people. It is the tragedy which can occur if non-thought begins to excuse non-thought. This inability to transform could be a Red's worst nightmare. Shakespeare, however, helps to negotiate that nightmare. He, I claim, continually indicates transformation from victimhood to free moral agency. We see this indication of transformation in Act 1, Scene 3 of The Merchant of Venice. Shylock says, sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. Sufferance here seems to mean suffering. Shylock here seems to identify with victimization. Sufferance in Shakespeare's works, though, can have a dual meaning, indicating both persecution and piety. After all, in Henry V, how refers to the ceremonial sufferance of kings and gods as a sort of piety. He says, what kind of god art thou that suffers more of mortal griefs than do thy worshippers? In this use of suffers, Hal is not speaking of victimization, rather of compassion for his soldiers during a time of war. Hal himself is displaying the personal freedom necessary to be able to choose compassion. Hal is, for the moment, being a free moral agent. This same word in the mouth of Shylock, therefore, can indicate his potentiality. Shylock's comment could be interpreted, being a free moral agent is the badge of my tribe. Shylock's downfall into revenge would then at least be seen as what it is, as a resounding mistake next to the true foundation of Abrahamic religions. In this interpretation, therefore, Arendt's worst nightmare would not just disappear. It would remain in the Shakespearean image of a non-thinking Shylock complicit in his victimhood. At least, however, this image could indicate a new Shakespearean paradigm, one which is founded on an ancient tradition of moral agency. Shakespeare's unavoidable dramatic nightmare could serve to cut a flash vision of moral agency and love, the focus of Arendt's PhD thesis, through the worst nightmare as understood by Arendt, rather than cutting through human flesh. Such a flash vision, or epiphany, as it occurs in Russian characters, is charted and described in my PhD thesis. Ultimately, this epiphany in the merchant setting, I claim, can, in the words of Arendt, open up to us with unexpected freshness and tell us things no one has yet had ears to hear. The epiphany can illuminate an agency away from victimhood towards moral agency and help to engender a transformation in the making, where this transformation is radically needed in this world today. <laughs>